years. During that time there, I provide short-term forecast. When I say short-term forecast, we're talking out to 10 days uh, for planning for our hydro operations that include uh, dam operations and river operations from Jackson Lake in Wyoming all the way through the Hell's, river, or the Hell's Canyon complex on the Snake River to the point where the snake dumps into the Columbia. So quite a distance and we're doing, we do forecasts for that entire area. Uh, we forecast for about 256 points uh, along that area. So with that type of operation, we need lots of data. We need to be able to uh, look at what's happening and uh, move forward with that. Along the uh, way in those five years, I've also been involved in and helped to develop many of the renewable forecasts that we utilize in Idaho Power, so for wind forecasting, solar forecasting, to look at how much generation is going to be produced. And then as far as uh, how much generation we need, I've helped develop the load forecasting operations that we, or the models that we use right now. Um, one of the other sides of it, and this may be applicable to you guys, is part of our planning operations is we look at what we need to support load operations over the next 20 years. And we look at that, we do a, a formal uh, planning uh, event every two years, and we're looking at, again, what data is available and what projections are available that can give, inform our decisions as we move forward. And kind of the final thing that I am involved in Idaho Power is I help support the, the Idaho Power cloud seeding operations that exist throughout the central uh, Idaho mountains and eastern Idaho. And that is designed to augment snow pack in the winter, which eventually runs down through the river operations in the summer. So when we start talking about types of weather data, um, it's good to kind of define what you're looking at. When most people think about weather or standard weather, what, what's out there, people are thinking about temperature, precipitation. If you're in the southeast, do you think about relative humidity because that's a big impact. Here we don't think about it too much because we typically are pretty dry. And winds. When we start thinking about energy, whether it's solar operations, wind operations and things, we, we include a little bit more but we also include uh, da data from and modeling of solar. And that's a, a little bit unique in how it's utilized. And as we look at this data, there's a lot of different uh, temporal and spatial resolutions that you can deal with. Uh, when we talk temporal, we can look at data that encompasses decades, looking at uh, climate, what are the averages? What are the median values? What are the, you know, the max and min temperatures through those times or winds? We can look annually, we can look monthly, and all the way down to sub-hourly. And my understanding is that you guys, in your design, uh, the modeling and stuff that you do, kind of use all that because you have to design for the, the, uh, the kind of extreme events but you also have to bring in what happens, the variability that occurs in or out, in or out. Boy, that's a hard one to say. And then, uh, you know, try to make sure that everything is covered in that area. And then spatially, when we can look at, from weather point of view, synoptically, so what happens across the entire United States? You know, is, is there trends there? Or can we bring it down into regional, local, and then micro scale? What is happening on top of us right here and what's happened there over the time frame. So those are kind of the things that we try to look at. And as I was trying to figure out what you guys need, because engineers, architects are slightly different than hydrometeorologists, um, I ask Elizabeth a lot and I ask a bunch of folks in the uh, um, Idaho Power world and they basically everybody just said, give us data. And I was like, wow, that's, that's a tough one to fill. So what I decided to do was start out and give you some examples of data that's out there free that you can utilize in those different temporal and spatial extents. I'll leave this uh, PowerPoint with uh, 
the IDL here, so you guys don't have to copy or do anything like that. And uh, so most of the sites that I'm talking about apply to the Western United States. Some of them apply Eastern United States, and then some of them are global, so that they can be used around the world. I'm going to start out with the Western Regional Climate Center, if I can find a mouse. There it is. And this is a site that is housed down in the Desert Research Institute in Reno, Nevada. And as you can see across here, it, uh, it provides access to data across the entire United States. I've selected the, the site that goes to the uh, western United States itself. And for my example, I will go to southern Idaho. And come on. There we go. So what this site has is historical data um, in some places extending from 1880 through this week. And all of these red spots are where data is available. So to give you an example of what is available, I'll go to this one right here, which is the Boise Airport over uh, just south of us. And if we look at, across the uh, left-hand side of this, you can see that they've provided some kind of predetermined uh, climatology for you, kind of the standard 30-year windows. Uh, this should say 1981 to 2010. The screen is kind of cutting it down a little bit. Uh, 1971 to 2000 and then down. Um, and you can see it across the right-hand side, it gives you kind of what you typically expect. Average temperatures, average temperatures, precipitation across monthly values. And those are, uh, can be helpful for general planning. But what we want to look at from this site, I think for what you guys would use, is um, down in the bottom side of this, a, it says daily data, has a, uh, it's called a lister, and then if we go in here, and we won't pull up all the data because we don't want to um, look at years and years worth of data at the same time. But and this site requires a uh, passcode, but all you have to do is email the DRI folks, and they'll send you one that day. All they do is track who uses it to say, you know, corporations, universities, things like that. And then you can select any of these data sets that's available and have it brought in in any format that you wish. There we go. So this type of data comes in daily data sets for any place that's on that location and uh, typically comes in comma-separated uh, values. Uh, in this case, max and mean temperature, precip, snowfall, and snow depth. Basic information, maybe for construction type of work, things like that, and uh, some information as far as requirements for individual buildings. As you can see, I said within about a week, and they're up to date to the 14th. So that's available across uh, the, the entire United States. And if you dig into this data uh, that's listed on the left-hand side, it can give you a lot more information. And it's all free, which is the really good thing. And keep in mind as we move forward that this type of data is available for many places on a daily value. And then we can use these values to inform more discrete values, so hourly data for some of the work that we may want to do that hourly data is not available for. All right, let's see if we go back. All right. I want to log in. This place is called uh, Meso West, and it is, once again, it's uh, a free data set. All you have to do is uh, register with them. This one is, uh, as it kind of implies, is very specific to the Western United States. It is, uh, but instead of just having um, 
one kind of a data set like the DRI set was. This one can connect to National Weather Service data. It can connect to um, data sets that other entities have, say like the National uh, Interagency Fire Center that's out here at the airport has uh, weather stations all throughout the mountains, throughout the western United States and eastern United States. And that along with other entities such as the Bureau of Reclamation, the Forest Service, anybody that collects data in the United States has their information in here. So uh, a fairly simple process for this, you identify right here a station ID and I'll show you how to find those shortly. And then if we come back in here, and we'll, uh, we'll just do a one month time frame. And you can pick either all of the information. In this case, uh, you can see that there's quite a bit more in there than the last one. It has wind direction speeds, gusts, pressures, uh, ceilings, clouds, winds, temperatures, so again, more data. And um, we'll see how long this takes. Uh, but as I'm going through these data sets, what I was looking for things are things that are really easy to access, things that you could uh, pull from anywhere, you know, whether you're sitting here, at home, in a coffee shop. And then you can start using that in your planning. It is not one to come in. Let's see here. Well, um, we'll skip that one since for some reason it doesn't want to come in. Can you show that down the right down to the bottom there? Right there? Nope. Yeah, I didn't want to push that one, did we? Oh, no. <laughs> Here? Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's on the browser. Oh, okay. Then there's a little Excel tab at the bottom left, just about the middle right there. Ah, there you are. Thank you. Yep. <coughs> uh, we will stop that one. Okay, so. As we uh, so looking at this data, you can see that it's basically the same uh, format. It's nearly all of the data sets are consistent. The biggest difference is if you look at this data here, it gives you what's readily available here is the temperatures, relative humidities, winds, and degrees. And as you move that direction, more data. But more importantly, it's in five-minute time steps. Um, so many of them, you can get into those sub-hour periods and really look at the variability that's occurring in a locale um, based upon what is there. Those are predominantly from some of your sites like this one, which is from the National Weather Service or the FAA. Uh, they also come with a number of the uh, more detailed areas like the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, Corps of Engineers, and groups like that. So when you combine all of these areas, you have a, a fair amount of data there. All right. So this ASOS is another data set for similar to this, but it, it's automatically broken into uh, or mapped out. And the reason I wanted to show it to you is because some of the times people are a little hesitant to use data sets if they don't know the identifiers. So each, you can go in here and right up here you can select uh, the different states and stuff and it shows you where all the data is available in a, a clickable format. And it gives you the, uh, an easy access to the same type of downloads and gives you all the same information the other one did. Um, the other one's kind of more of a one that if you're very familiar with weather data is really simple because you can pull up a lot of data quick. This one is a little more time consuming but not significant. 
So do you guys do any type of work, say, with dams, uh, river structures, uh, bridges, different things like that? No? Okay. So then we'll skip this one. This is the Bureau of Reclamation. It has two sites. One's called Hydromet and one's called Agromet. They provide really good um, hourly data and in some cases 15-minute data. They're predominantly, and I'll, I'll show you a, a locale from this one. Oops, hopefully. There we go. So from this site, this is the Pacific Northwest region. It's all the red dots are the, uh, locations for these sites. The important thing from um, kind of a design point of view is that all of, nearly all of these have solar irradiance observed on them. And many of the other sites do not. So if you're looking at um, energy efficiency, uh, solar power, different things like that, it's a very nice format. And working with the folks at the uh, Bureau of Reclamation uh, two years ago, a lot of the sites in the Snake River Valley and in Eastern Oregon, they started producing that data in five minute uh, periods instead of one hour period. So a very high resolution data set for the solar side. Are those sites generally at dams or? Um, not always. Between the agrement and the solar, and the hydromet, they tend to be at dams, reservoirs for the hydromet side of it or stream gauges. Okay. The agrimet, is spread throughout uh, the agricultural areas. There's two located in Boise itself, one on the east side and one over at the uh, fairgrounds. So you kind of get a spread on those. And uh, that tends to be the way they do them. They don't have them in the higher elevations. Okay. On the east, can we access the stream gauges? Yes. Well? Yeah, you can access the stream gauge information. You can ask, access the uh, calculated information. So if you have a, a stream gauge that has dams up front, uh, or upstream of it, sorry, a lot of times there's regulation associated with those dams. So the Bureau of Reclamation and a couple of other groups of Corps of Engineers calculate a natural flow. So you could actually take a look at what would be in the Snake River if there was no dams or no diversions or anything like that, and which is really nice when you're looking at climate projections. If you're trying to see what happened in the past and move forward, it, if you can't take the people out of it, it's tough. So that, the, that's really good data set. And then some of this goes back into the 1800s too, because we actually have had people monitoring out there with a stick monitoring the stream gauges or the streams for quite a while, as well as temperatures. And that's really important when you start looking at some of these longer term designs, is if there's locations in Boise or other cities that they've been uh, monitoring max and min or hourly temperatures since the 20s, that's a very nice data set to utilize. All right, All right. and because the last set does not deal with the mountain areas or the higher elevations. I wanted to show you this one, which is from the NRCS, which is Natural, Natural Resource Conservation Service, part of the USDA. And if you look in this picture, uh, you saw all those blue dots, and every one of those is an observation point, and it contains all this information. It's a snow, precipitation, uh, soil moisture, temperatures, winds, stuff like that. The only, um, we'll just click on one of these so that it, it takes us back to a picture. Um, the only constraining portion of this is that this process has been only done since the 70s. So it's a moderately short record, but it's a fairly high resolution record. So if we look um, in this, you can see that in the east, they're fairly 
sparse, but not bad. But in the West, this is the lifeblood of most of the um, Western United States climate research that goes on because they have all of this really interesting information from different organizations. And um, let's see here. So if if we look at a place like uh, this, which is the Bogus Basin site, uh, at where the ski area is just north of Idaho or Boise City, we can go in there and get a well fun thing, a current picture, which is snow that we got the last couple of days, and then you can kind of get an idea about the information. And one thing that's really good about this set of information is that they have all the uh, kind of metadata for their instruments when they were calibrated, when they were changed out. And that's one thing that a lot of data sets don't ever tell you because they change out uh, instruments and you see this change, you know, something happened in the 70s. What happened? Well, they just changed instruments. But you can go in, you can get daily data, current water year data, historical data back as far as it goes, and then hourly data. And if you come down a little bit below, you can see that there's more in here, but um, some of the interesting stuff is the soil moisture and temperature. So if you're looking at foundation development and stuff like this, it has some fairly decent information. And that type of information is also on that aggregate data that you had. So when you start looking at stuff that is from Boise or other cities, it's available. All right, so the, these next ones I think you'll find pretty interesting in that these are, are more wide-scale ones. So these are available not only in the West, but they're available throughout the United States and around the world. It provides information for those too. It's a standard kind of .gov page. It's from NOAA, and it uh, says the climate. And the interesting thing about this one that just went away is that they're saying now we're going back to a, possibly a La Nina, which for the Pacific Northwest is really good because we tend to get more snow, more precipitation, and kind of mild stuff. But what we want to look at is maps and data here. And if you're doing kind of planning for what solar is available, what temperatures are generally there, what precipitation occurs in different months. This type of uh, area here, you can go in and locate any of that for any of the uh, United States and most of the world areas. And then if you really want to dive into it, you can go into the data sets and you'll see that on the left hand side here, there's three, 33 different sites, there's 16 global sites, and then one regional. And it gives a whole, the level of definition can go from uh, synoptic scale with, say, the stress index maps here, down to individual cities where some, they have the hourly data that was recorded by an individual uh, taking observations. And most of these are very good because they're telling you what kind of clouds, what kind of, uh, say, for the winds, what kind of movements occurring with them, what kind of shear, things like that, that might be utilized in uh, larger building construction. And if we kind of go down, you can see everything from like things like drought maps to, uh, if you look at this one, this one I, I thought might be fairly interesting because uh, you can develop wind roses for an individual point. You put the lat long in there and we'll develop one from the historical data sets that tell you the strength and the direction of the winds at different elevations in the atmosphere. So you can use that as part of your planning record. All right, so we have covered a lot of data. Um, and I was going to cover these, these other two sites. They're both from NOAA also, and, but they're very similar to the previous ones we've done. You, uh, you click on things and it gives you the individual one you want uh, with the data that's available. This day map one, uh, 
I think is one that potentially could be quite useful if you're planning uh, or doing design stuff. It comes out of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It's a large-scale modeling thing. But the one I like is part of it is this single pixel extraction point. And there we go. So anywhere in North America, including most of uh, Canada, you can go in here. Oh, again, this is a free site. All right. Thanks for being patient with all my sign-ons here. But the one I like about this is this is another one of those where you go in and you put in the site that you're interested in. So if for the building that we're setting in right now, generically, this is our, our latitude and longitude. And I can go in and pull everything from 1980 through 215. That's the previous year, typically. And you can pull um, everything from temperature, uh, max and min, daily um, precip, wind speeds, vapor pressures, and solar irradiance. So you're not tied to your weather station at the airport, which is a, a really um, strong tool. Because most of the time, that's where you're your limitation is, is oh, they've got an airport 50 miles away. Well, in a valley or even in the neighborhood in the north end of Boise, that doesn't do you any good. Um, hmm. It's still spinning, isn't it? Well, we won't worry about that too much, but the... Uh, Again, one of the things that is nice about this is that you can do it for any area that you want. It gives you the daily max and mins. There we go. And if, uh, if you're working with a climatologist or a meteorologist or a modeler, you can take these max and mins across a given day at a point offset from say your weather station that has hourly data, you can use this information to inform your hourly data and transpose it to your work site to give you an idea of the variability associated with temperature, solar, and different events like that where you're working when you might not have the data available somewhere else. Okay. Well, looks like I just killed it. It's spinning. So um, what I'll do is I'll walk through these just uh, very quickly, and then I'll open up for questions. And what these two sites were are similar uh, data sets to what we, uh, we just saw where you can go in and put in the latitude and longitude. You can pick a state. You can pick a county, however you want to look at it. And you can go in and get normals, uh, whether it's monthly, annual. And uh, when you do these, these are based upon 800 meters. You can go 4 kilometer or 800 meters uh, squares or grids and do the uh, analysis there. You can look across annual, single month, monthly, and then you can go in and pull daily values again. This is a modeled um, product that covers pretty much the entire United States and most of the world. So you can look at other areas when you're, you're building that you can get the daily values and 
if you look down towards the bottom, um, you'll see it's the same kind of stuff, precipitation, temperatures, um, vapor pressure, things along those lines that may be useful. And that goes, this model data, if you believe it, goes back into the 1800s. Realizing that model data is usually driven by now by observations and satellites. We didn't really start getting satellites until the 70s, so anything before that was based upon kind of spotty observations, either from ships or somebody taking an, a manual observation. So as you get further and further back, uh, you have to use it with a, a bit of caution. But as you move past 1970, the data is quite good. So that still gives you 50 uh, years worth of information. And uh, I won't bring up this last one, but this is, this day mat is from the U.S. government. It's uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. This is out of Oregon State. It's funded by NOAA. And this one is from the Netherlands. And it, it's a very nice system for worldwide use. And it provides uh, very similar information, but it also provides more information on solar and wind. So that it can be utilized for renewable type of planning and stuff like that. So not to get too crazy, but if you're really looking at solar, either uh, generation or trying to use renewables within your, um, your, your building sites and stuff, this Solar Anywhere is a company out of Washington. And they do modeling based upon uh, a couple of techniques. But basically, what they're able to do is provide you modeled one minute solar irradiance temperature and winds at any place in the United States. It costs money. But if you're doing a, a large scale study, like when we did the, um, the solar impact study for Idaho Power, we needed high resolution data. And the best data at that time was the Bureau of Reclamation data that was one hour. And that's when we started working with them and they started uh, outputting the data at the 15 or five minute intervals. So they, they started writing it, but it wasn't good enough historical. So we wound up buying data from Solar Anywhere to, as part of that data set, which was really good because it really let us look at the uh, variability in our hour to see how that would impact or strengthen generation. I threw these two in here. Uh, they're two commercial entities, but they are capable, uh, again, of providing very high resolution QC weather data. And that's really important because some of these entities, the fire folks and stuff, um, depending on how busy the season is, they may not get around to QC in their weather data for a year or two. And these people, when you get the data, it's QC throughout the process. I'm not uh, saying these are the best people out there, that this is just examples of folks that are there. So if you decide that you, um, historical data has been beneficial and you, you've done some design, but you want to look forward into how do we uh, prepare for changing climate, cl climate variability, however you want to look at it. The best stuff out there right now is some of the um, high resolution climate projections that's out there. And there's a couple of them that are done regionally. Uh, John Abatsku at the University of Idaho is a climatologist up there. And he has a, a project called MACA which is a downscaling that takes global climate models, downscales them, and bias corrects them to the Pacific Northwest. Those are readily available. You can go in, pull that gridded data, if you're into gridded data, digging into points. But you can pull that information, and it's, av it's available at fairly high resolution across the whole Northwest. And you can use that. And that is, uh, goes out to 2090 in different chunks. So you can look at temperatures, winds, precipitation, variability, inner hour, different things like that. Boise State, Alejo Flores is 
has been started working in that arena, and um, they are doing a lot of really nice work there, and I believe the engineering department there is doing some work also. Um, I didn't put uh, the contacts here or the URLs, but University of Washington and Oregon State are both doing great work, and nearly all of this data is readily available on line at their sites, you just have to be willing to go in and get it and dig the data out. So in general, I've given you a whole bunch of, of uh, possible places to get weather data, uh, historical weather data, uh, at different resolutions and both temporally and speci uh, spatially. Um, they're all free, with the exception of those couple that I said charge you to put it together for you. Uh, the projections about what's going into the future are available. And that's pretty much all I have for you. I guess uh, any questions that you might have or other areas that you'd like information on that I can provide Elizabeth and uh, she can get it out to you guys. So, <clears throat> That's what we call TMY data, typical meteorological data. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the latest set is 91 to 2005. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious your thoughts on relative accuracy of, you know, by decade. You know, how was it back then? How is it now? How is it headed? Is that relatively accurate, or is there something we can do to improve the accuracy of those cloud? Well, most of those data sets are based upon uh, the observed data. And there is, of course, a little, there is, uh, I won't say of course, but there, there is c concern with some of the earlier data sets just because of instrumentation changes, as I mentioned earlier, and um, how the data was maintained. Uh, as that has been moved forward through time with this last data set, it is getting a lot better. There's probably some minor concerns still in there from equipment and different things like that. But it's much better than, say, the data sets that we were utilizing 20 years ago. As far as improving them for the future or utilization currently, there is work that you could do with that, um, with um, observations from your current area. But without spending about an hour sitting here talking about statistics, uh, which nobody wants. Um, I would say that they're fairly nice data sets and, and reasonable for what they're designed for. That doesn't say much in it. There are a number of really good papers in the last 15 years throughout the Western United States. Um, Phil Moat from University, used to be Washington, he's now in Oregon. Um, Danny, uh, Denny Litmeyer, uh, just there's a whole series of them that look at predominantly um, temperature changes and precipitation and state changes for that precipitation and and the impact. So, and what most of the work has been done is in the mountains more than in the uh, flatlands or in you know the valleys, and the reason being is that's where the snow is and the water resources, and that's what everybody's interested in. And what, in general, not you know not every place, but there's been a, a, a apparent minor increase in temperatures across the, that time frame, and what we are seeing is shifting of the snowpack. So meaning when the peak snowpack uh, used to be in the 80s, you looked at April 15th. And in many cases, that has moved forward so that the peak snowpack is occurring earlier with kind of a shift in precipitation and temperature regime, meaning at the higher elevations, the temperatures are warming up a little bit earlier so that we're losing that peak quicker. So there has been uh, some indications of changes, and um, there's a lot of papers out there, uh, peer-reviewed ones that are uh, showing that. Um, somebody that's done a lot of work locally is Charlie Luce from the uh, U.S. Forest Service. He's here at the Water Center in the um, 
Rocky Mountain Research Station, and he showed a lot of changes, more importantly, in the uh, stream flow, in the variability in kind of the lower quartile, where when we have the lower um, flows, we're seeing much more volatile, volatile, or not volatile movement in the uh, in that. So, um, and from project management and for say generation management and stuff, that's a really worrisome uh, thing because it's really hard to understand how to deal with such wide variability when you're already in a dry event. So there's a lot of work and there's a lot of local work. If you're into fisheries and stuff, Dan Isaac at the Forest Service has done a lot of work. Um, John Abatsku, the, the guy from U of I that I mentioned, has done a lot of climate work about Idaho and the Pacific Northwest, as has Phil Moten, the, uh, the uh, climate change uh, consortium out of Oregon State. So if you're really interested in that, you can really dive into it with not a lot of effort. Yep. Well, thanks a lot for being here. Um, so most of the models I deal with rely on that hourly data that, that Tim was mentioning there. And there's been several times where I've been able to find where I've got a location where I can find min, max, average temps, but not that daily, but not the actual hourly temps. Mm -hmm. And so I've done some digging and found some crazy sinusoidal equations with a bunch of variables based on those min and max and averages and been able to kind of work it out. But I, I did see that you showed at least one, two, or two or three resources there that can pretty much just with latitude and longitude give you hourly data, I believe. Correct. Um, is there one of those that maybe you'd recommend over the others when it comes specifically to hourly and kind of a custom site? Generically, uh, the National Weather Service and the FAA sites are, their equipment is quality controlled and their data is quality controlled at a very high level. So if you have a choice of a data set from that point, it's, it's usually very good. Uh, the other data sets, the NRCS, the um, Forest Service, the Bureau of Reclamation, do a very good job. but they may not be as um, on time doing that QC, simply because they, they'll have one person doing the Pacific Northwest. So it may just take them a while to get there. It may be a couple of years. Um, so, you know, if you, were, if you had a choice, National Weather Service FAA sites are typically by far the better sites. Uh, you saw uh, predominantly those were like five-minute data sets. So really give you that in or out or variability. And their instruments are highly um, maintained and quality controlled. One of the, the first three or four you showed allowed the latitude and longitude. And mm -hmm. you showed, do you remember off the top of your head which one that was? Um, there, there's a series of them there that, uh, come on, one more. There we go. Um, the uh, meso, this one, the Western Climate, uh, Regional Climate Center, is only by station. The uh, Meso West, you can put in a lot long, and it will give you the ones that are closest to it. Uh, and all of these are similar in that aspect. It's not until you get into the NOAA, the DAMET, the PRISM, and the KINME that you can actually put the lat long and go specifically to your point. Great, thank you. Yep. Well, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, in terms of, I know we at the lab have run into issues before where we've got um, some data sets that we're, I guess, trying to average what the temperature might be given a specific latitude or longitude. And in Boise, you know, we've got inversions in the winter, and that seemed to skew our solar data and our temperature data quite a bit versus stations that were, you know, just outside of that inversion. Um, so, is there um, one that you, you'd say that is, is would kind of avoid that inversion issue, or um, in terms of if you're putting in a specific latitude and longitude, you're getting that exact location and not necessarily an average of a few different points? Well, the, uh, 
the day met the prism and the kidney, which gives you the, the daily values. Um, these are within uh, 800 meters, depending on which set you use, four to 800 meters, and this is 800 meters. So in general, the data it's going to give you is fairly defined for that area. The stations themselves, of course, are limited because they are where they are. Uh, but you can use those stations in many times to identify those inversions as well as to kind of quality control some of the data that you get from the models. So, I know this is probably something you could talk quite a while about because I, I think it's real cool. You probably do as well, but our cloud cloud seeding efforts. Mm -hmm. um, number one, you know, I hear real interesting estimations on how how much impact that has, five percent, something like that, as far as increased snowfall. Can you number one talk about how they measure or calculate that that benefit from our cloud seeding efforts, and then also talk a little bit about what conditions um, need to be in the atmosphere for us to, to think that's a good idea to go out and do that? Okay. Um, well, that kind of comes back right to our data sets because there's a, a number of ways to evaluate whether a well-run cloud seeding program is successful. And the first one is a statistical method that goes right back to some of the data sets that we've talked about here, specifically the snow tail sites, which are the stations up in the mountains, and they're fairly high resolution. Uh, the way that historically the, that process has been evaluated is through a target control analysis. So utilizing data from before cloud seeding occurred, they develop a relationship between a group of stations within the, the cloud seeding area and outside and basically develop a, a, a statistical relationship, a, a linear regression type of or multilinear regression that identifies um, with what occurs outside, what should occur inside. Anything that occurs above or below, below that line is the change affected by cloud seeding. Um, the one, for example, the longest term one that we have in the Boise, or the Payette River Basin um, is the area we've been at. That statistical relationship is uh, at a nine, a point nine, an R square of 0.986, which for a natural system is extremely good. Um, the other way to do that, and it's a process that we're working on right now, um, Idaho Power is working in conjunction with NCAR, which is the National Center for Atmospheric Research. It's out of Boulder, Colorado, and they're the people that developed the WARF model, the Weather Research and Forecasting model that's utilized now by the National Weather Service by uh, numerous universities, uh, whether that's U of I, BSU, just tons of those, they developed that model and we worked with them to develop a cloud seeding module that works with that, that uh, simulates cloud seeding activity. So we input when cloud seeding occurred, how long, different things like that. And the uh, WARF model runs in a control mode and presents how much precipitation would have occurred without cloud seeding. Then they use the physically based cloud seeding module and run it again and then they do a, a differencing between those two runs and you get a spatial extent across your, your zone on how much precipitation occurred within each one of those things, um, which gives you a change in precipitation, a percentage, you might say. We have went a step further and we're utilizing the WARF Hydro program, which is a physically based hydrolog hydrologic model, and we take and run both of those data sets through that and look at what the actual change in flow is. Which, because it, if you know precipitation and climate, there is what falls on the mountain doesn't necessarily make it through the river because you've got evaporation, transpiration, you know, all the different things like that. Um, traditionally, a well-run uh, program can increase precipitation in a uh, basin from 5 to 15 percent over uh, the seeding period. Uh, some years you see up to 20 percent. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, 
thanks very much for having me and hope hopefully I answered most of your questions. If I didn't, uh, please send them to Elizabeth and I'll try to get them answered.